All right. Hello again, Avengers, and welcome to another exciting in-depth review. Yes, this is where I take a an RPG book, this time the Enigma of Combination for the Transformers RPG, and I do an in-depth review. Now, when I say in-depth, I mean in-depth. I talk about the things that I don't like. I talk about the things that I do like. I talk about the things I do poorly. I talk about the things that they do really well. Um, however, uh, it does get really, really long. I go chapter by chapter, sometimes page by p -p 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 page. And uh, it turns into very long videos. And sometimes people don't want to watch a two-hour long video just to figure out if they want to be able to uh, purchase this uh, th -th thing. So I always start off with a should you buy it section where you separate groups into three different buying groups. The first group is players. These are people that are primarily, not exclusively, but primarily going to be playing a single character at a t -t 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 table. The second group is game masters or GMs. These are people that are primarily, not exclusively, but primarily going to be sitting in the game master chair. And they're going to be running all the NPCs and writing the adventures and the, the things like that. They have very, very different needs than players do. The third group is a group that I call lore hounds. Lore hounds may never actually sit at a t -t table to... Uh, play a giga game but they're really interested in the lore and the world that the rpg inhabits so obviously they have different needs in the other two groups um so uh, should you buy this well let's find out first things first if you do enjoy this content please remember to like the video subscribe to the channel hit the bell icon to turn notifications on all those things are super super important let's talk about this this is stuff The first group should players b -b buy this. I have done a ton of Essence 20 stuff. I've reviewed, I think, almost every Essence 20 core book and supplement. I haven't uh, done uh, almost any of the adventures, but I've done almost every core book and supplement for Essence to 20. It's another Essence to 20 game. It gives you new kick of character options. The unique thing about combiners for players in particular um, is there's a couple different flavors that you can have that are going to give you very very different experiences um, the first group are going to be kind of the mega form versions of c c combiners these are these are mega swords mega swords for for i mean it's it's what they are um and uh there's two different ways you can do that uh a player can become a part of of a mega form or gigantiform i can't remember what the the exact words are again i will find them in a little bit here um that uh is created by the player and then a bunch of npcs and that has a very very different methodology uh to be able to play it well and to not kind of make them the star of the show then the other way you can do it where it's just either some of the team or, or the entire player base has the ability to form into a single gigantiform th 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 thing. So there's that thing. And then there's also these uh, th 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 things called, I think they're called binded pairs or something like that. Basically, it's where a transformer um, forms uh, a, a kind of like a psychic bond with a smaller life form, like a human or they, uh, there's this other group called the Nebulons. Um, that are actually technology-wise, they're about on par with uh, Cybertronians. They're just not robots. Um, and so, what that turns into is, uh, in your alternate form, it's very, very normal. But for your bot mode, um, you actually have to have this other combiner, this binded pair, with you. Otherwise, you can't transform into your. Um, uh, uh, into your b -b bot mode because they will they will become your head or they will become another part of you. Uh, there's also one where they can become your weapon and in that particular instance you can turn into bot form without them but you're at a bit of a disadvantage. Um, and so again that's a very different b -b -b play style in general your binded partner to the thing uh, is an NPC. They kind of become kind of similar to like a pet class but not really because it works differently. Um, 
And I don't, I, off the top of my head, because I read through the whole damn book, um, I don't remember them giving real rules for players to basically be able to play a binded k -k 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 companion uh, or a binded p -p pair unless you're just the Transformer. They don't give any rules in this. I'm pretty sure you could jury rig something if you wanted to have like a Power Ranger uh, or a G.I. Joe that also be able to, uh, is able to k -k -k combine uh, with a uh, Transformer. Um, and they do have, I guess, some rules for how to make NPCs do that, which I guess you could use for, for that. So, yeah, I guess that's another thing to do. So as far as players, there's a lot of new rules. New, uh, There's a new focus for every single role in the core book. And the Mode Master gets two new focuses. Um, the vast majority of the focuses are really cool. Um, there's a couple of that, it, it's not that they're bad or anything. I was just like, yeah, okay. Not my play style, not my thing. Um, but they, uh, so there's a lot of new that, uh, uh, there's a lot of new focuses. There's new, uh, influences and origins that are almost exclusively if you want to play a combiner style character. Like, I don't think there's any influences or origins that you're going to be able to go, well, I don't want to be a combiner, but like, they're all, they're all based on that. Um, and when you get to the, the, that chapter, they do uh, have a thing that I hate that D&D &D does it. And I think Essence 20 does it slightly did it differently, where you actually get a perk, which is the equivalent of a feat, as part of your influence. Um, so, 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 yeah. So as far as, you know, is this, like the book itself is, is 45 bu 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 bucks. I think the PDF, I can never remember this. Enigma of Combination uh, RPG. Come on. There we go. I'm going to see if I can find the... So yeah, the book is 45. I want to say the PDF. Normally the PDFs are about 30 bucks. So that's what I'm going to assume it is because I can't find the PDF on here right now. Um, so yeah, for 45 bucks, especially when you factor in that shipping is like 10 bucks, so this turns into about 57 almost $60 b -b -b book. Um, is it worth it for p -p players? There's a lot of stuff here. Um, like the book is just barely under 130 pages. It is not a massive book, but it is very, very uh, information heavy. Like I said, there's all these new... Uh, focuses which are probably the biggest expansion and the unique thing about the focus is like i said the influences in the oil uh the influences in particular are almost exclusively if you want to play a combiner you need to do this um or um if you want to use these you need to be a combiner you don't have to use them to be a combiner um uh but the focuses are much much more varied um, and can be used in just about any uh, game. And then they also have a bunch of new equipment options in there as well that, again, just about any player can use. They even introduce a new damage type in here called, I think it's energy. Um, so there's just, a, there's a ton of stuff in here um, specifically for players. Um, the second half of the book is exclusively for G -G GMs. So there's about half of the book that the players aren't going to be using, but the amount of stuff in the first half of the book that is useful for both players and GMs, I would say um, for a $60 book, again, when I'm factoring in uh, shipping, um, it starts pushing it a little bit for me. I still think it's worth the like 57 and change once you factor in shipping. Um, that uh, you pay for this. Uh, definitely the PDF um, is is w w worth it uh, for, 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 for players. Because again, there's just, there's a ton of stuff in here. And so for 30 bucks, um, it's a really nice to the deal if you are interested in playing tr tr Transformers. And again, if you've got the um, the crossover b -b book, um, the vast majority of the focuses, at least, uh, you can use um, you can use in other games if you uh, do the crossover rules and everything th 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 thing like that. So there's a lot, and then obviously the equipment and, and options like that can always be used. They have a new thing where. Uh, when you create a megaform style uh, 
character because they become very, very big. Any weapons that they use grow with them. And so one of the new equipment types is gigantic weapons, which the G.I. Joes are never going to use. You can't use like a bus sized laser pistol. Like there's just no possible. So that stuff would be exclusive to Transformers. But the rest of the stuff, there's a lot here that you can use. So I would say PDF for players, uh, definitely yes. Uh, the physical book, which as of right now, you can get the PDF for free if you buy the physical, which is why I always get the physical. Um, just the book itself, I'm a little bit, if you're, if you're into Transformers, it's, yeah, you're going to en enjoy this. Um, if you're just getting it because you're an Essence 25th fan, maybe just focus on the uh, PDF or get it somewhere not from uh, Renegade. Um, if you're looking for the physical, like maybe Amazon, if you get it through Prime, you can get free shipping or your friendly local game store where you don't have to pay for shipping. That would be a better way to get it to make it easier. Because 45 bucks, I'd say I'm okay with that. Once you factor in shipping, it just gets a little too expensive for me to recommend it for players. So... Moving on. Just realized I'm almost out of water, so I'm going to get another one before in the middle of the thing I have to get water. There. Now I have two water. So, the second group should GMs buy this book. Uh, again, this always comes with the, the, the uh, I guess, the the assumption or whatever if your players want to play a combiner the gm is going to need access to this book they may not need to buy it themselves but there are brand new rules for how combiners work and how they um how they're piloted especially if it's um multiple players that are combining into one mega form um and they don't work like megazords like my first thought in here was going to be oh they're just going to they're just going to make it work like a megazord uh, and they don't they have unique rules for how combiners work and it's different than how megazords work um from power rangers so in that bit on its own yes you're going to need this now as far as the kind of just amount of stuff that is useful for G -G gms um the new equipment options are as a gm i love having new ways to customize weapons and things like that i know a lot of people kind of consider that a player thing because the players are requisitioning the weapons and stuff like that but that's not how i generally tend to run uh my games i like to even when the players have a lot of input on the stuff that they can make i still like to design things for my players um, and I think it's really, really f -f 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 fun in that particular uh, aspect because it can be a way to kind of reward the p -p 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 players um, by simply me doing my own due diligence of figuring out how it is the players play their characters, the things that their characters would want, the things that the players themselves would want. Um, and it's always fun for me to be able to come up with player options that my players really, really enjoy. Um, so anytime you're giving me a new way to customize effectively magic items, um, I'm going to be happy with that. Um, and uh, again, there's a, a bunch of new stuff there. And then there's an entire bestiary section as well, well, well which is mostly uh, Decepticon combiners. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is they will have each individual bot that makes up the combiner. They will have a stat block for each of those. And then they also have a stat block for the combiner itself. So uh, that gives you a lot of leeway in how you want to use them. You can have combiners be a threat because the big megaform combiners are deadly. Like in the lore, they are they turn the tide of battle, uh, and a lot of them, um, like the uh, what were they the Combaticons, their uh, megaform. I have to remember what it's called. Uh, is it Devastators? Of oh, Bruticus. Bruticus is their mega form. Um, Bruticus can take out like you know entire companies of just regular such transformers because it's this massive, massive transformer. It's really, really strong. It's got these massive weapons. Um, and so, from a GM perspective, using uh, 
using combiners as a threat is really, really fun because you start off with like the basic, the regular to the transformers and putting them up against the players. And then you introduce the combined form and it massively changes the outlook. And especially if you do something like the, uh, uh, the Constructicons, um, uh, whose kind of combined force uh, is uh, Devastator. Um, and the purpose of Devastator is literally that devastation. It's not to, you know, kill off Autobots. It is to destroy buildings and area. Like, that is the entire purpose of Devastator. It just goes through like a natural disaster and just level cities and things like that. So when you're dealing with these combiner threats... Um, it gives you the option of creating a lot of different scenarios where player death is not the loser, uh, the lose condition. Um, it could be that if we don't stop them from combining or um, if after they're combined, if we don't find a way to get them uncombined fast enough, uh, then a city is going to be destroyed or they'll break through a dam and flood an entire area or... Um, they'll destroy a source of energon that the Autobots use to power their base or something. Like, there's a lot of different situations where it's not going to be, let's make sure we can get their hit points down faster. Like, the idea of, we need to prevent these guys from combining because their gestalt form is going to be so powerful that we can't deal with it. Um, and so that creates a very, very different... Uh, play style where controller style uh, roles are going to be significantly more useful th 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 than uh, the ones that just do straight up the damage of which there is a focus here that is pure control and I love it um, so in that aspect this gives you a lot and then the last chapter chapter 5 is combiner campaigns um, it gives you a bunch of tips on how to create combiner kind of sub arcs and arcs or entire campaigns where you're dealing with some kind of a combiner threat whether you want your players to be the combiners or you want them to be fighting against combiners and the way that they do combiners is again you can take an influence um that makes it so you uh are basically creating the character to be a combiner and the way that they do that is a bunch of these influences get a combiner perk. Um, which, again, I'll talk about that when we get to that section. But um, but there also are just general perks that you can t to take that give you the ability to become a combiner. So you can have a campaign where they start off as a kind of fledgling combiner group that has to kind of grow into their power. Or you could have the campaign that you're already running. Uh, and you introduce a combiner enemy for them to deal with, they realize they're not going to be able to fight uh, this combiner threat on their own. And so uh, as they grow, they all make the decision of what if we became combiners uh, so that we can fight this threat. So they give you a lot of those different options. Um, and they have uh, uh, campaign seeds and arc seeds that go all the way from tier one all the way up to tier four. Um, so overall, do I recommend this book for GGMs? If you are a Transformers GM, meaning you are running a Transformers game, highly recommend it, even at the physical price with shipping. Um, it's definitely worth it. Um, just the new threats. Even if you don't want to play with the combiners, there are so many new threats in here um, that you don't have to use their Megaform versions, and they're still really useful. Um, but in addition to that, Again, it allows you to run campaigns that you really couldn't otherwise and uh, challenge your Papa players with unique forms of uh, social and combat and kkkk counters by dealing with these uh, k -k combiner threats. And it also gives you kind of a, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're good at templating, uh, you can create your own combiner g -g 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 groups, whether they're a combiner ally, because uh, they do have a few Autobot combiners uh, uh, in here. Um, I think like the Protectobots or Autobots, right? Yeah. Um, 
and Defensor is that. So again, uh, if the players don't want to be Kika Combiners, you still have the option of introducing Combiners on the Autobot side that they either have to help or maybe we'll come in to help them every so often. There's even uh, things that allow um, uh, someone that is not a Combiner to join a Combiner that doesn't have enough uh, uh, people to, to, to do it. And so you can introduce just these kind of one-off events where they get to play as a combiner and then uh, go back to normal. So definitely a, a, a recommendation uh, for G -G GMs if you're a Transformers GM. If you're not, your mileage may vary. This is a very, very Transformers book as far as uh, Essence 20 is concerned. Other books um, are uh, a little bit easier to kind of translate to uh, uh, other... Uh, things however um as far as like a transformers power rangers crossover the combiners could be a really really good template that you could use to create an evil ranger team um and again because combiners run differently than megazords um it would mean that a megazord fighting a combiner despite the fact that you're going to flavor them as both megazords is going to be very, very different. Um, and that could make for a really, really interesting Power Rangers threat um, that could basically rival kind of something like uh, the, the, the Psycho Rangers, uh, probably one of the greatest uh, arcs in Power Rangers hit, uh, history was the kind of Psycho Rangers art in um, Power Rangers in Space, where they had to deal with these characters that were specifically created to kill them. Like that was the entire purpose of each one of the Psycho Rangers was just to kill their color equivalent. And it was a phenomenally interesting crossover. You could definitely create your own kind of Psycho Rangers. And instead of using the Psycho Ranger rules in, um, uh, in uh, Finster's Monster Matic, you could basically reskin a combiner team as Psycho Rangers um, and make them very much more kind of, uh, instead of being monsters powered by magic or whatever it is, you'd be very, very kind of machine oriented. It could even be a rival group, kind of like uh, the, uh, what were they, the Silver Defenders? Is that what they were called? In Time Force, um, where they they were like, well, the, the Power Rangers are vigilantes and we don't want them doing that. So we'll create our own you know military force that can do the same thing as the Power Rangers. And eventually they could go rogue or something. Or maybe the whole organization was never meant to protect the world and they were meant to take it over. Like so many different plot threads that you could create with a Power Rangers crossover with this, this stuff. So yeah, like I said, overall, definitely a recommendation for Transformers GMs. If you're just an Essence 20 GM in general, um, a slightly less strong um, recommendation, but still there. Um, and then if you just don't play Essence 20 at all, you probably want to get other Essence 20 books first. But uh, I know my audience. I know you guys love Essence 20. So, yeah. Moving on. The third group. Should Lorehounds buy this book? Something that Essence 20, and I say this over and over and over again, something that Essence 20 does better than probably any other RPG system um, and I say Essence 20 and not Renegade because Renegade also publishes uh, the World of Darkness books, which World of Darkness books are basically like a novel that accidentally had some game mechanics spilled on it. Um, the World of Darkness books are pain in the ass to uh, get through if you're just trying to pull the mechanics out. However, they're extremely lore heavy and extremely interesting in that. Uh, the Essence 20 has a really nice balance of there's tons of lore in there, but... The mechanics are broken out uh, in a way that it's very easy to pick out the mechanical parts if you are trying to use it as a RPG source book instead of a novel. Um, and uh, they don't really uh, fail in that here. Uh, the first chapter, chapter one, the sum of their parts, is just effectively uh, a TED talk about combiners. Literally, it's what it is. I can't remember the character that does it. Let me see if I'll, I'll look it up real quick. Um, there we go. From Turg, Turgmagax? Or Termagax. There we go. Termagax's lecture at Autobot City. What are combiners? 
So the entire first chapter is just this character Termagax explaining what combiners are and, and all this other stuff. And it's super, super lore heavy. And they have these interjections where people from the audience ask questions. You never hear the questions. You just think it'll just be talking. Then you'll see something like, yes, Boulder. I suppose 2,500 stellar rotations could be considered quite a long time for a species that only lives a handful of decades. But please save all further comments until the end. And so that happens repeatedly throughout that entire chapter. Um, and so the, the whole first chapter, um, which is you know, a little over like a dozen or so p -p pages is just lore. Um, and I read through almost all of it. Um, when uh, I realized I was spending so much focus on this part and I had the rest of the book to read, I started skimming because I needed to get through the book to do the review. Um, but it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's written in a very conversational manner because again, it is effectively a Ted talk. Um, and so I really, really uh, enjoy that aspect. Every, just like every other Essence 20 book, every single influence, origin, and role has a lore explanation before any of the mechanics come. And I think that's how RPGs should be made. Um, and not all RPGs do that. Um, I know a lot where they will just go into the mechanics really quickly and then they might give a paragraph or something and go, by the way, this is why it happens. Or they might explain why it is later in the book or something like that. But Essence 20 um, in particular really focuses on if we're going to give you a mechanic, there's going to be a lore reason behind it. Um, and even when you get to the threats and allies, I would not say threats and allies is nearly as detailed as something like Mordenkainen's... Um, tome of foes where it was basically it was it was meant to be kind of like uh a uh, a textbook about these monsters that just so happen to have monster stat blocks in them um essence 20 generally doesn't go that hard but they do give a brief little description before each one of the 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 the, 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 the uh stat blocks so you have some lore on each one and the artwork is really pretty Essence 20, um, I believe for all of these books, a lot of the artwork that they get, um, they take from the comics um, and from the toys themselves. But it really doesn't matter where they get the artwork from. It's gorgeous every single time. Like, the book itself is very, very pretty. And there's tons and tons and tons and tons of lore in here. Um, so for lore hounds. Again, when you factor in shipping, do I think this is 60 bucks worth of lore? Probably not. Um, it uh, Again, it's only 120 pages, and especially chapter three um, is all about the new equipment. There's very little lore in there. And then chapter two, which is all the character options, there is lore in there, but the vast majority of that chapter is mechanics. Um, and so if you're not really into it for mechanics, um, you're really going to be reading chapter one, um, a decent amount of chapter four, and then chapter five. So the two middle chapters, which is about like a third of the b -b -b book, um, you're not going to be reading. And for 60 bucks, uh, again, with this only being, you know, 127 some odd pages, um, that's a little bit much for me. If you get it from your friendly local game store for 45, um, I think that's a p -p 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 pretty good deal for the fiscal. And then again, 30 bucks for the, uh, uh, 30 bucks for the PDF. It's hard not to recommend it. There's, there's enough here for a lore hound that I think 30 bucks might be w w worth it for a lot of l l lore hounds. Like it, I, again, you're probably, again, I got through the entire book in like a couple hours, but I was skimming. Um, so I don't know, is, is 30 buck, 30 bucks worth a couple hours to you? That'll be up to you. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting stuff in here. And again, the artwork's amazing and other stuff like that. So it's, uh, uh, for, uh, lore hounds, it's, uh, very much sold on the p -p PDF. You'll, you'll probably enjoy it if you're a fan of transformers. Um, uh, the physical is a little bit more d -d difficult. I know lore hounds in general tend to get a little bit more out of physical than uh, other groups because, uh, other groups, you're not using the physical product the majority of the time you're playing you're you're doing other things you have your character sheet or you have all the other stuff you're running as a gm lore hounds your entire interaction with this is going to be reading it and so i just think physical tends to be more advantageous for lore hounds that being said 
find a friendly local game store and pick it up. Don't pay shipping for this. It's just it's just not worth it at sixty bucks. Or again, find it on Amazon or something like that if you don't have a friendly local game store. See if you can get it on sale or something like that. But support your friendly local game stores. All right, so moving on. So quick recap. Uh, for players, uh, the full-priced version from Renegade with shipping is a bit uh, of a hesitant yes, but it's a yes. Anything from the $45 physical or the $30 uh, d -d 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 PDF is a definite yes. Uh, for GMs, even the $60 uh, with shipping directly from Renegade physical, I think is worth it. And then definitely the $45 a regular price uh, or the thirty dollar, um, thirty dollar PDF is worth it. And then for lore hounds, thirty dollar PDF definitely. Once you start getting into the physical, your mileage may vary. I wouldn't recommend full on from Renegade with shipping and everything. Find it from a friendly local game store, get it on Amazon somewhere where you can get rid of the shipping. Maybe getting on sale. Um, so yeah, that is the the, 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 the uh, should you buy it section. If you just came here for a recommendation on whether you want to buy it, uh, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, again, please remember to like, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff in the comments to the down below. Do you have a favorite combiner unit? Is it one of the Decepticon combiners? Do you like Bruticus? Do you like Dev Excuse me, Devastator? Um, do you like uh, the, the the Autobot c -c 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 combiners? Um, that do really, really good, good, cool stuff like uh, uh, Defensor and all that. Uh, let me know in the kicky comments down below. Otherwise, let's get into the in-depth review. As a reminder, this in-depth review is literally that, in-depth. I'm going to go chapter by chapter, sometimes page by page. I'm going to talk about the things that I like, the things that I don't like, the things I think they did well, the things I think they need to do better. Um, this becomes a very long v v v video. We're already at 30 minutes and I haven't even started the in-depth part. Um, so I do put timestamps in here. Please do not feel bad if you cannot sit through this in one sitting. Uh, YouTube would prefer me to tell you, no, sit in the chair, keep your eyes open, watch this in the entirety of the time. It's just not worth it. So I will be putting, um, uh, I will be putting timestamps. Feel free to kind of watch this at your leisure. That is the way that this is designed to work. Um, that being said, it is time for us to dive in to the in-depth review. And for me to finish that bottle of water and open mm, a new one. Opening a bottle of water with a tremor is always an interesting experience. All right, so... Chapter Zero, join together. Uh, every single Essence 20 b -b 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 book has this. It's basically their kind of introduction to the b -b book before the introduction. Um, they're generally very, very short. It's normally just a page or something. Um, and most of the time it's written in universe somehow. Um, so you'll have an in universe kind of thing that talks about it, and then there will also b -b 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 be kind of a little description of b -b 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 what this is. And that's really all it is. It talks about, you know, there's four new influences, three new origins, eight new focuses, um, a host of general perks. You know, it's, it's advertising for a book you've already b -b purchased. But the artwork is really, really good, good, good. I don't know which mega form uh, it is that they've created. Or, or that they have on this page, because I don't know the combiners very well. But it looks really cool, and it's a nice little introduction. So that's all that this is. Moving on. Chapter 1. The Sum of Their Parts. Again, this is your lore introduction to what are combiners. And it does a phenomenal job. Again, something that Essence 20 does better than just about anyone on the market right now is all of their mechanics have a lore basis. And what I mean uh, in that is there are a lot of RPGs that they will start with the mechanics and they will come up with lore to justify the mechanics. And that's not a bad thing. Um, 
However, I think RPGs in general are stronger when you start with the lore and then come up with mechanics based on the lore. And Essence 20 does that so well. And this first book, or this first uh, part of the uh, first ch ch chapter, wow, can't to talk, is such a great example of that because they um, uh, they t -t 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 talk about the kind of two different flavors. You have Gestalts, um, which are things like Devastator, where a bunch of Transformers combine together. And then you have what are called Bonded Masters or Bonded Pairs. Binary Bonding, there we go. Um, and they give a very, because this is meant to be kind of a Ted talk, you know, university lecture kind of thing. They go into pretty specific detail about, you know, lore wise, where they come from, how they work. It's really, really interesting and fun. And it's just remarkably well written. And then there's artwork throughout the entire thing that is absolutely gorgeous. Like the whole thing just feels really, really good. And then after they explain what combiners are, they go into the history of them, where they fit into the history of the Transformers. They talk about the Enigma of Combination, which is an actual item that is basically what fuels uh, the... Uh, the ability to become a c -c -c combiner. Um, and so they have an entire section on that. Um, they talk about how Gestalt forms were, were kind of just lost for a while and now they're becoming significantly more common. Uh, they talk about bonded mastered and binary um, binary bonded uh, c -c characters, which is the other flavor of c -c combiners, which is really, really interesting and fun. Um, uh, and then they have a few... Um, data files on uh, the various different uh, combiners. So like they have the Combaticons, the Commandos, the Constructicons, uh, and then uh, the Predacons, and uh, then a, 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 punch, a bunch of binary bonded p -p 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 pairs, um, which are really, really c -c 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 cool. Um, and then they also have Autobot combiners. So the Aerobots, the Protectobots, the Technobots, uh, the Torchbearers. So just a ton of inspiration for various stuff in here. And this is all done in universe. Um, so it's all really, really great. And again, they have amazing, amazing artwork in here. It is upsetting how good the artwork is in these books. Like they're just phenomenal. I want these to be like a TV series that I can watch because it's just so good. And there's so many interesting stuff in here. So yeah, and that's that's the chapter. It's just it's lore, lore followed by some more lore with a side of lore, uh, and it's wonderfully well written. Moving on, chapter two, combiner characters. So this is your character options chapter. This is the one that most players are going to flip to first. They there is an issue that I have with this. And the thing is, uh, the uh, chapter two, uh, the character options, is separated in a normal kind of separation. You have your influences part, your origins part, your role focuses part, your general perks part. This is how most most new source books for Essence 20 works um, when they're doing the character options. However, after the general perks, they have uh, a section called combiner rules. And this is where I, har I harped on Daggerheart. I've harped on Essence 20 many, many times. Basically, all of the RPGs that take their lesson from D&D uh, &D on how to organize their source books, where you start with character options, and then after you've done all the character options, then you talk about rules and how to play the game. That is backwards. It is wrong. And they do that here as well. They have combiner rules at the end of chapter two, and none of the set, none of the stuff in here makes a ton of sense until you understand how combiners work. Especially since, again, my first Essence Twenty book was Power Rangers, as was the vast majority of people that play Essence Twenty now, because Power Rangers was the first book. Power Rangers has a system for creating mega form robots. It's Megazords. And the combiner rules don't work like Megazords. They're similar. There's a lot of similarities, but there are some very distinct differences, especially since 
uh, the combiner uh, rules uh, don't, uh, uh, like combiners keep their own hit points. Um, whereas a megaform just has a combination, like a mega, a megazord is the combination of everything. Combiners are a bunch of individual units that work together. And so because of that, they have their own hit points. Um, they can be forced out of their combined form if enough of them get knocked out. There are specific perks that make it so you can keep the mega form going longer th 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 than uh, it should be, be able to. Um, so it doesn't work the way that Megazords work. And because of that, when I was reading through all the character options, a lot of them seem to just not make sense. Because in my head, I already know how a mega form works. I have Megazords. And because this is a different set of rules, it becomes very, very confusing. And again, I can say this over and over and over again. I do not think Essence 20 um, and Renegade is ever going to change because this is the way that they've designed to do their books. And the only thing I can say is you guys are 100% wrong. Introduce the rules first, then give us character options. Because we have no idea how useful these character options are going to be until we understand exactly how the rules are going to be used. Um, if we, uh, you know, if you say something like, well, yeah, this is a, it's a free action to do this. And you haven't told us that a free action isn't free, that you have a limited number of them. Then people are going to have a massive uh, kind of letdown when they realize, oh, wait a minute. I can't do this as many times as I want because it's free. Free actions actually have a cost. And that's kind of what happens in here. Again, and a lot of this is kind of Essence Twenty's fault because they already have rules. Um, and I'm not I'm not against the fact that combiners work different than Megazords. I love that. I think it's great. I love the way the combiners work. My issue is they introduce something that is so similar to something that already exists that most people are going to assume that it's going to work the same way, and it doesn't. And they don't reveal that until after you've read through all of the stuff and already have formed an opinion on how it's going to work and how you want to use it. And then you find out, oh, by the way, the rules have changed. It's just a bad way to do it. Start off with the combiner rules at the front and then go through everything else. Another thing that made me a little bit more hesitant. Um, I mentioned this uh, when I talked about D&D 5th Edition. In early D&D 5th Edition, you had, as part of your background, you would have a background feature, which was a unique ability that only someone from your background could do. And they were definitely different from feats. Feats were things that you could take that would massively change how you play your character, whereas background features were basically just an additional ability, an additional power that you had that was based on your background. They weren't meant to vastly change how you play your character. They were just meant to be another thing that you could do that nobody else could. Um, basically, you could treat them very similarly to just an additional character feature or something like that. Um, and then later on, because people just were ignoring their background features because Wizards of the Coast just never gave them any reason to use them in any of the printed materials. Even the D&D Adventures League never mentioned backgrounds. Um, and so it was a way to make backgrounds more useful instead of trying to write things in and, and make people use the stuff that already existed. They just got rid of background features and gave backgrounds the ability to give you a free feat, which meant that because feats were so much more powerful than background features, older backgrounds were at a huge disadvantage compared to someone using a newer of a background. And I hated that. I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world, leave feats alone. These influences, their influencer perk, their influence perk, which is basically the same as a background feature. Oh, sorry. Uh, my, my water just fell over and it scared me for a second there. Um, so with, uh, Influence perks, they worked very, very similar to background features where they just gave you a, a single new ability that you could use or a new benefit that was related to your uh, influence. Um, and because of how influences work in... Um, uh, because of how influence 
will uh, influence his work in the Essence 20 system. You can have multiple influence perks and you can mix and match them. It was a really, really cool system. The influences in combiners, um, most of them just give you uh, a general perk. And most of them will give you a general perk, uh, a list of general perks to choose from uh, in the same way that their potential hangups are just a, a bunch of different... Uh, you get to choose your potential hangup instead of having one, only one that that's... Uh, gets to it and so again when it happened in D, &D i hated it i thought it was the dumbest thing in the world perks in essence 20 work a little bit differently um especially since again the first essence 20 game uh i learned was power rangers which because there are no subclasses in power rangers there are no focuses for the roles um the way that you make your Power Ranger different is by a combination of uh, general perks, power perks, and Zord perks. So it is uh, it is much closer to something like third or fourth edition, where feats are significantly less valuable, um, and the feats are not meant to massively change how you play your character. They're meant to just give you an additional ability or, or give you a buff in s certain situations. So in that particular aspect, I don't have as big an issue with the influence perks being, hey, we're just going to give you a free, we're just going to give you a free general perk. Um, because right now an influence perk and a general perk are not massive power differentials. I don't feel that if you take a binary bonded influence that you are going to be massively overpowered compared to someone that just took influences from the core book. Um, that being said, it also, for me, kind of makes a little bit of s -s 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 sense in the idea that I, I've mentioned this many, many times before, um, complexity for complexity's sake is a detriment to a game. When you just add a new system simply because you can, it makes the game worse. And basically what they've done here is instead of creating a brand new system, um, they basic uh, uh, a, a brand new system in order for influences to give you the abilities of combiners, or really for any um, uh, for any transformer character to become a combiner. Instead of creating a brand new system that you now have to put onto that, they just go, "We're going to make it a perk. We already have a system that works that we can modify in order to do that." And instead of trying to come up with new influence perks that are going to work well with these new combiner perks, they're like, you know what? Let's just give them combiner perks. So I'd have to play a few games with combiner characters to really get the feeling of whether or not I think they should have their own influence perk or if I'm fine with them just having access to some extra general perks. Uh, but overall, it's not as distasteful to me as it is with D&D, &D, where I still just vehemently despise getting feats as part of your background. I think it's really stupid. Um, so I'm okay with that here. Um, and they introduce a couple new potential hangups, which I am which I like. I, I think hangups... To me, hangups uh, are what make your character. I just think they're that much more fun. Um, and... Um, yeah, I mean, there's really good stuff, and I guess I, I'd forgotten about this. There is a, uh, uh, there is actually two influences. I I said before that the influences are, are almost exclusively. Do you want to play a combiner bot? Well, then you have to do do, 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 do one of these combiner influences, or if, uh, if you take one of these combiner influences, you have to be a combiner. Um, they have two influences that are not. Um, based on combiners. Um, they have one that's called Morale Booster, which I really love. Um, I'm just gonna read you the description of it because it's it's just a great influence. You are the social glue that holds a team together and just a few words from you can persuade your friends and comrades to do greater things. Whether it is with heartfelt gestures, thrilling speeches, or even just a few well-timed jokes or wisecracks, you can keep their spirits, uh, keep up their spirits better than m -m most. I love this kind of character. I love playing this kind of character. They're super great. And again, they have an influence perk that's not here. We're just going to give you some, some general perks. They have an actual influence perk. So that in and of itself makes me 
feel better about the idea that the uh, combiner ones, the combiner influences give you combiner perks and the non-combiner influences that are still part of this book give you regular influence perks. So it's not the, again, since D&D went to, we're gonna give you a free for free. Not only has every single new background that comes out in a D&D book had a feat attached to it, they have retroactively added, if you choose a, uh, uh, if you choose a background that doesn't have a feat with it, you get a free feat generally the skilled feat or i can't remember what the other fifth feat they could give you it might be the toughness feat the one that just gives you extra hit points um so they had to basically change how all of their stuff before worked to justify the fact that they were giving out these really powerful things and it's obvious here they're not doing that because they're introducing new influences that still have the old influence perks which i like again i don't want your background, which is what an influence is. I don't want your background to just be a way for you to get an additional feat. I want feats to be their own thing and backgrounds to be their own feat. And they 100% are still doing that here. And again, Morale Booster is a cool influence. I love it. Uh, and then the other one they have is Titan Spark, which is basically, you're just a roll bag. You're, you're a roll bag. Um, which again, I really, really enjoy the fact that, yeah, we're going to introduce an influence of your big especially since i have been big most of my life uh, i think in like seventh grade um i grew like six six inches in like a month uh, and i went from kind of average height uh for uh my class to like second tallest in the class because we also had this kid named alex who was one of my best friends in middle school uh who was like seven foot tall in like fourth grade like he was always just a giant and he just kept getting bigger and bigger. We used to call him Sasquatch. Let's put it that way. Um, and he leaned into it. Like he would come up to people randomly uh, because he was so much bigger. He would just come up and like, duh, duh, and he'd go Sasquatch. Duh, 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 and he like drum on their head and then run away. Uh, anyway. So I like the fact they introduced a, an influence of you're big. Uh, so yeah, enjoy that. A uh, bunch of new hangups. Like I said, I love hangups. And some of them like arrogant is a new hangup. Um, and I just, I'm just gonna, uh, again, I'm not a fan of, of, of giving out like specific mechanics and stuff. So I want you guys to go buy the books, support the publisher, but I have to talk about how they turned arrogance into a hang up mechanically. So you think of yourself as better than most beings and it shows in your behavior on your first turn of a combat. After you test initiative, you can't attack enemies whose threat level is lower than your level though you can make an area of effect attack that includes such enemies if it also includes at least one enemy whose threat level is equal to or higher than your level. It is such an interesting mechanical thing. And I like the fact that they limit it to your first turn only. Because after that point, arrogance would go away when you're getting shot in the face. But I love the fact that if the GM just creates a situation where you're facing kind of a, a large group of lower level enemies, because that's a really common thing in RPGs in general, that an arrogant character would just go, you are all beneath me. I don't even need to shoot you. Ah, never mind. I love that. I think it's really, really interesting. And it would mean that an, a character with the arrogant hang up would either need to give up their turn the first turn, which is not fun, um, but can be an interesting payoff um for uh having a character that that is their hang up but it, what would be uh, significantly more interesting is they are foes they are forced to do some kind of support aspect because they can't attack enemies but they can um they can help their allies they can they can prepare themselves so they can be more defensive or whatever like there's a lot of different things you can do from a mechanical b b b standpoint and kind of justifying that with arrogant I think it'd be really, really f f funny if, again, bunch of lower level c -c 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 creatures and the arrogance like, you, oh man, these guys, no way am I going to waste my bullets on them. You go ahead and do that. And you just give them a little pat on the back. Go for it, buddy. And that's how you help out. You give them like you give an aid action or something that just makes them do something a little bit. We're just going, go ahead, you. I think that's great. And then you get bit in the face. You're like, now nah, I'm fighting. Anyway. Um... So yeah, those are the influences. They have a couple new origins. And again, if you, you're not familiar with Transformers, Origins is effectively 
if you're comparing it to D&D, that's the races. Um, uh, uh, but uh, your origin is where you get your alt form. Um, and the new origins are kind of interesting. They have uh, charger origin, um, which is basically, it's, it's a vehicle that is meant to like be a battering ram effectively. Um, and so it's really, really interesting. And the alt mode specifically, you can be either a ground or air and you have 45 feet of movement, which for, uh, for transformers in general, your kind of standard movement is around uh, 45 feet. 30 feet is a slower one. 60 feet is a faster one. Um, and sometimes you get all the way down to like 20 feet for a really, really slow one. So 45 feet is not... I guess 30 is kind of a little bit more average. So 45 is a little bit faster. And then 60 is the super, super fast ones. Um, so the Charger does have some speed to it. And you can either be ground or air... Um, but the origin benefit that you get, um, uh, basically when you're pushing or shoving, uh, you're considered one size class larger and in essence 20 in particular size matters. I know normally I'm a huge, huge believer in the idea that people put way too much emphasis on size. Okay. Just because something's smaller doesn't mean that it's not just as good or even better sometimes like a lot of times like people think like some people and i'm not going to say who but they get this weird thing that they just want you know something really really big and it wouldn't be fun if it was really really big you know really really big sometimes you know smaller you can have a lot more fun with that is all i'm saying or oh, in essence 20 size matters um particularly because larger creatures there's a um uh, there's a thing where larger creatures um, have benefits over smaller creatures and they have detriments over uh, smaller creatures. Like larger creatures, the size um, will change, will give you upshift and downshift depending on the person targeting um, their size and the thing that they're targeting. So in combat, larger creatures have a harder time hitting smaller creatures depending on how big the size difference is. And when you're doing like pushing and shoving and stuff, size matters, it changes. So the fact that these guys are just all about moving people around, I think is really interesting. Um, then the other, uh, uh, an, uh, one, uh, or the neck. Wow, I just can't talk. The next one is the pillar. Um, and they're, they're exactly that. They are the, the, the pillar. They're, they're big. They're meant to, to, they're the tank. For that and their origin benefit is called fate their origin benefit is called face me i will let you guys figure out the mechanics there <laughs> it's it's a cool origin b -b 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 benefit um uh and then uh the last one is called speaker and this is another one uh that i really love um because the speaker It's a control. It's a control origin, which is not something that you see a lot of. Like in most games that do have like a controller role, um, the controller abilities are almost exclusively going to come from your class choices. Um, I don't think I've ever seen like a racial ability that's meant to be more of a control-based ability, unless it's something like. Uh, high elves get access to a cantrip and theoretically you could choose a more control style cantrip but even then in D&D &D 5th edition there really aren't quote unquote control cantrips um, aside from maybe like um, lightning lure because it has a movement aspect to it but most control uh, abilities and spells in D&D 5th edition come at least as level 1 spells um, so the idea that you basically have a controller style thing where the origin benefit is called till all are one. Um, and it's really, really simple. Once per scene, if you roll a critical success on a skill test, the team gains a story point. So story points are your kind of generic players get to be DM for a sentence. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can use story points to the benefit. The uh, speaker uh, is built around the, 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 the idea that when they do well, everybody does well. 
and I just love the fact that that is built into the, 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 their uh, origin. So I guess it's not really a quote-unquote control thing, but it is a very much support style uh, origin. I think it's really, really good, 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 cool. Um, so yeah, those are the new influences. Now the roles. Um, I'm not going to go through every single new role, but I have to talk about the new analyst focus. The analyst in and of itself was already a very much a support based class and it was a really cool class. But the new analyst focus is called hub. And it's defining ability at first uh, level is called data bridge, which is basically you can use a free action. Uh, oh, wait, let me see. So yeah, you use a, a free action to basically steal uh, or use a uh, language or skill specialization possessed by a different ally. So maybe you have an ally that specializes in ranged weapons or martial art weapons or something like that. In the middle of a combat encounter, you can use Data Bridge to basically borrow their specialization so that you can use it as well. In addition, you can burn another free action to let another character use that and you basically become a data bridge exactly like that um, and you can keep doing that as uh, a rate of one ally per free action spent so you can basically data uh, data bridge your entire team and as you gain levels in this focus it adds more benefits to be to using data uh, data bridge and it's such an interesting thing because this is a hundred percent kind of control support and uh i mean there's just so many really interesting things like they have a triangulation thing where if you have multiple data bridged p -p 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 people all attacking the same target they get benefits because you are literally triangulating uh in it and you get upshifts and stuff like that that, 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 that. um uh, you could burn an Energon point to remove a condition from one ally and give it to another. So things like if you have an ally that's frightened, you can pull that frightened condition um, and give it to someone else that's on the d -d 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 data bridge c -c 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 currently. Um, and so it can be a really, really effective way to kind of gain uh, 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 mess with the action economy by going, okay, well, this person is really being screwed over by their fear condition. Maybe this person is stunned and we need them because they can actually cure stunning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer the stun to this other one. Then this person is going to be able to act and they can actually cure the stun on this one. Now the stun condition is gone and we haven't had to do anything else. It's just this hub doing it for us. It's a really interesting thing. Um... I think uh, the field, uh, the new field commander one is called Team Leader. And again, it is... Uh, Team Leader is another one that has a very much kind of control, almost Warlord from 4th Edition style to, to, to it. And then um, Team Leader just, again, kind of exemplifies the, 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 that. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, again, a support. Then you have things like the new gunner focus is called Cannoneer, which is just me have big gun, me shoot things and blow them up which is cool. Um, the mode master focuses are, they have a bonded master and then they have component aced with bonded master is designed. Uh, if you want to play more, uh, if you want to, um, really focus on being a, uh, binary bonded pair, uh, and you get a bunch of benefits to that. And then component ace just makes you the ultimate, uh, gestalt member and gets you really, really cool, cool stuff there. Both of which are super cool. That's what it was. Um, the counselor is a new scientist feature. And this is 100% the control focus. It is such an interesting th 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 thing because everything they do, like they have an ability called words can hurt. And basically as a standard action, you attempt a performance or persuasion skill test against the target's willpower or cleverness defense. On a success, the target takes either a psychic damage or gains the frightened condition for 2d2 rounds, your choice. So 
the counselor is just a pure control. Like one psychic damage is useful, I guess, but that particular ability, they become immune to the attack um, for the remainder of the scene after you do it once. So using it just for one psychic damage is really only going to be beneficial if they already have low hit points. Um, but the ability to just give out the frightened condition for a few rounds is really, really nice. And they just have other stuff. Like, it is just a pure control thing. You support your allies. You uh, uh, hurt the enemies. That's all you do with it. And it is such a cool focus. I want to play a counselor uh, in Transformers. And the one, the picture they have uh, below the new scientist fo uh, focus is Freud, who I'm assuming must have some kind of like maybe his alt form is an is an air conditioner or something but he has all of these like air intakes all over his form and it makes him look like a gundam like he just looks like a really cool looking gundam uh and the color scheme is all there like it's just a cool looking thing i love counselor i think it's really cool uh new scout focus is surveyor which is another one that's that's really interesting and very much about uh map understanding and then the absolute best one ever there's a new warrior focus called pugilist they added a monk folks there are monks in transformers doesn't quite work like a monk uh, uh and there uh, it's an interesting th the thing but i don't care it's a monk i can play a monk autobot i'm good um <laughs> everything about it i think is cool all right uh, so that's the new roles. They have a bunch of general perks. Most of the general perks are either um, stuff that's going to help you with combiners or they have a bunch of contact perks. Uh, the contact system has existed for over a year now. It's basically a way for you to basically call NPCs in to help you in an ally or, or in a s situation. Um, and they have specific rules for it. They go over the rules in it here again. Uh, but I think the Space Power Rangers book was the first one where they uh, introduced um, combiners, or not combiners, um, contacts. Um, so if you want like a full in-depth, I think it's that book. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments down below. Um, the contact system is not new. It's a great system. And there's a bunch of perks that just give you a contact. Um, which is, again, it's a different way. Um, normally, the way the contact system works is your team has to kind of de befriend them. And depending on how they feel about you, that will depend, uh, that will change how often you can call them in and what they can do. Um, this is just a, a perk that gives you a k -k 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 contact. Um, so it's a different way of doing it. I don't think it's a bad way of doing it. It's just, it's just a different way of doing it, which I really, really like. Um, and then, uh, yeah, for the most part, like I said, it's just, um, a lot of different stuff that's going to make it easier to play combiner characters or make cool combiner stuff. And then the last section is the combiner rules. And like I said, this is not just Megazords in Transformers. There's a completely different way that they work. Um, so like I said the, the biggest difference is the uh, combiner form has an array of health based on its component members instead of adding all the components health together into one sum is divided into component pieces for example a combiner trio with components who have 5, 5 and 4 health doesn't have a health of 14 their health is instead represented as 5 uh, 5 slash 5 excuse me slash 4 so, the way that the combined form runs is a little bit different. You can target specific pieces um, to uh, uh, when you're attacking a combined form. You can uh, target specific pieces because once more than half of the members of a combiner form are knocked out, they are broken off from the combiner form and they have to go back in their separate forms. Another thing that doesn't really happen with Megazords. Um, and uh, yeah, and then they also, like they will, um, they will take abilities from their 
individual things and you basically get to decide uh they they get two attacks and those are chosen based on attacks that the separate forms have so it literally is a gestalt thing where you get to kind of bring everyone together and you take pieces in that and driving it they give a couple different um uh recommendations on on how to do it you can be done through consensus where everyone has to agree on what to do you can do it as one person is going to be kind of the leader and they get to uh make the final decision on what you do every to turn and everyone has input or you can literally just go all right this turn this person's going to be able to do it and this turn this person's going to be able to do it i don't think any of them have an inherent supremacy as far as which one is the best way to do it it's just interesting the way you merge into them is is kind of interesting um, and again, they do have a thing where uh, even if you are not a combiner, you can burn a story point, plus you have to burn energon points because the combiner has their own source of energon points, which is uh, a portion of the energon points spent to turn into the combiner that they can use for a bunch of their abilities. And once you are out of the combiner form, all of that energon is lost. So um, for uh, a non-combiner to join a combiner form, basically, let's say one of the members of your combiner team is trapped or unable to help you can get another cybertronian to do it or maybe you know defensor is here and one of their members just isn't there one of the players can kind of jump in but you have to burn a story point to do it and you still have to spend the uh, energy points and use a standard action to do, 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 do it um so again it gives you a lot of other options and ways to play around with combiners that doesn't require the entire team to go okay we're transformer power rangers um so yeah interesting sis stuff um and like i said it is an entirely different system than power rangers mega megazords like they just don't work the same way in any way shape or form there's similarities but they're very very different and because of the energon point system and everything like it's just it's a very different thing um and i like it don't get me wrong but i wish they had put the combiner rules at the front instead of the back moving on chapter three combiner armory so again this is just stuff because combiners are super super massive um regular weapons don't technically work for them and so the first thing that they have in the combiner armory is upscaling weapons basically when you grow um as i mentioned before uh the way the combiners work is they will take a, 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 an attack or a weapon that one of the members of the form had and that becomes one of the attacks that they get um so in order for them to use one of the weapons that one of the smaller forms had uh, they have to basically make it bigger. So they have an upscaling weapons thing where um, uh, it, it just, it gives rules for when the weapon grows, this is how it changes. Um, and they make sense for the most part. Um, they give some new example of weapons. Um, there's new weapon traits. Uh, the new element is called energy. Um which uh has its own kind of mechanics to it as does uh like that's another thing i really like about essence 20 is the damage type that you do is not just useful for well if they're vulnerable or resistant to damage like in dd fifth edition the only reason it matters what kind of damage you're doing is whether the creature has a resistance to it or not um in essence 20 each damage type uh can have resistances and stuff like that but more off uh but more important is each damage type has an additional ability built into it um and the energy um uh uh the energy element uh gets uh an upshift on uh creatures that are basically have grown or shrink if they change size energy is better at attacking them which is a really, really specific thing. Um, most of the other energy types has a lot have a lot of different situations where they'd be useful. This would really only be useful for combiners and very particular transformers that have very specific abilities. Like they mentioned the Mode Master's Mass Shift. Um, stuff like that. 
Um, energy theoretically could be very useful against things like Power Rangers monsters that have grown to very large size. It would work for that. Then the other new weapon trait, they have Titan class, which are basically just weapons that are made for Gestalt forms. Um, and then they introduce a bunch of new um, weapons, one of which is called Assault Claw. And my first thought was Assault Claw. Oh, cool. Amongst the... No, it's like a... Ch -ch 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 -ch. It's like a crab claw. Um, and allows you to grapple, which again, still very cool. It wasn't cool as I, I wanted it. Uh, they have this particular weapon called a breaker bar, which is designed to do extra damage and be easier to knock creatures out of gestalt forms. So if you are fighting against a, uh, a combiner team, having someone that learns or kind of specializes in breaker bars could be very useful. Um, then they have some other stuff like uh, blaster knuckles, which are basically they're own, they're Titan weapons, they're Titan class weapons. They can only be well wielded by massive creatures. They basically they're a rocket fist. They're a punch that basically, as part of your fist, you have blasters that don't point forward. Uh, the blasters or is it that what it is? Maybe it is. No, they're just they're they have. I'm gonna read it. Many Titanic Cybertronians implant energy blasters on the backs of their knuckles, adding an armor-piercing blast to their p -p 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 punches. So yeah, it's basically you have guns on your fist, and you go... So that's cool. They have uh, a new glaive weapon that they have, uh, a couple of different things. Uh, Magbola, which I think is really cool. Um, there's a gravity gun called a gyro gun. Um... Uh, they have a rail cannon. They call a rail rifle. Uh, some other kind of interesting stuff. And then some new weapon upgrades. Um, one of them's really interesting. Mass reactive rounds. Um, uh, and it, it basically just deals additional damage to any attack versus a target's toughness defense. So effectively, if you're targeting like something that's just big and tough, mass reactive rounds actually do more damage to it as opposed to a small agile thing. So that's a really kind of interesting uh, uh, upgrade. Um, and then they also had some armor upgrades uh, that are really cool. Probably one of my f -f 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 favorites um, is jet propulsion attachment. It's a rocket pack for your bot form, which I think is uh, c -c 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 cool. Um, and then uh, just some new um, general equipment. Again, that was one of my one of the things that that blew my mind when I was doing my Transformers uh, designing new dragons uh, was they had an entire section of things that you could use for your integrated hard points that weren't guns. Uh, and so they have some new support equipment and new um, general equipment um, that is pretty interesting. Like clawed feet is one or uh, support struts or pylons is another one that's kind of cool. And then they have a couple new um, artifacts like the Enigma of Combination is one of them, and this Forge of Solus Prime. Um, so cool stuff like that. Uh, and that's that. Moving on! Chapter 4 Threats and Allies. So I mentioned before, uh, this is a bunch of new. Uh, stat blocks for combiner stuff. Um, and they range in level from, in threat level from like they have a, th uh, a threat level 3 and a threat level 4 um, but most of them are going to be, the low ones are going to be like 5, 6, 7 uh, and they go all the way up to the higher level ones are going to be in the 16s to 19s um, and they have one that's a, a 25. Um, so wide range of the th 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 threats and uh, like i said what they will do is they will start off like the first ones they do is the combaticons and so they start off by listing each one of the individual combaticons uh stat blocks you have blast off brawl uh onslaught swindle and vortex and then they will have Bruticus. And uh, the various Combaticons, like Vortex is threat level 8. Uh, Swindle is threat level 9. Onslaught is threat level 14. So they, they all have kind of various threat levels in there. But Bruticus is a threat level 16. 
so significantly m -m 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 more powerful. Uh, and it is a dangerous creature. Like Bruticus in and of itself, the health of Bruticus is 1612998. Uh, and it has an anti-grav unit. It's got um, enhanced initiative. It's got a flamethrower. It's got a shield. It can just punch shit. Um, it is really, really interesting. And that's how every one of these combiner forms works. They were, the combiner form will always be a much higher threat level uh, the, than the individual modes. Um, and they're just powerful. Like Ruination uh, is the, what are they, the commandos? Their combiner form is called Ruination. Um, and it's another threat level, so this is 16. And it just, again, has a ton of really, really powerful abilities and a bunch of cool stuff. They also have a hang-up um, that makes them interesting to run. And that's just, like, the entire thing is just each one of these uh, combiner forms and then their gestalt form. They do have some binary bonded uh, pairs as well. Like Misfire and Aimless is a binary bonded uh, pair, uh, which is interesting and fun. Um... They have the Predacons, which is not Predacons from Beast Wars, but actual robots that call themselves the Predacons uh, that are supposed to be kind of the rivals of the Dinobots from the auto, uh, Autobots. And they form in the Predaking. Um, and then you have Scorponok, not Scorponok from Beast Wars, uh, and Lord Zarek, which is another binary uh, f -f 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 form. Uh, Skull Cruncher and Grax, you know, stuff like that. So again, there's not a whole lot I can and talk about in here without getting too much in mechanics, but there's, it's a bunch of new stat blocks for interesting stuff. And they have both Autobot versions and Decepticot v -v 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 versions if you want them to be allies or enemies. And they have binary bonded stat blocks for Autobots as well, like uh, Weird Wolf and Monzo is a, an Autobot. The Aerialbots is a uh, Gestalt form uh, that turns into, uh, who is it? Uh, Superion, who is a badass looking robot. Kind of kind of looks like, like a supercharged uh, Optimus Prime, but has a bunch of jets on it. Um, you know, stuff like Brainstorm and Arcana and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot I can say. They're good stat blocks. Um, they really don't have boring stat blocks in Essence 20, or at least not much of them. So, moving on. Chapter 5. Combiner Campaigns. So, this is kind of tips and, and tricks on how to introduce combiners to your games. Whether you want them to be combiner enemies. Whether your players want to become combiners. Whether you want to have binary bonded um, members and how you want to deal with that. It's good advice. Um, it's not particularly great advice for a non-Transformers game. Like a lot of times with these source books, there's stuff that you can use in other games. There really isn't for this. This is such a uniquely Transformers thing that you're probably not going to use this advice in anywhere else. But if you are a Transformers GM, it's great advice. Um, and uh, they particularly have a, a section where you kind of talk about for the combiner forms... Um, as we've talked about the for, uh, before, the idea of if there aren't rules to prevent assholes, then they're just going to run run over all the other players. They do have specific advice about how to kind of add some rules in there to prevent a kind of very forceful player from just overriding everyone else's things, including um, establishing a chain of command because the Autobots in and of themselves are very military in nature. They're going to have a kind of chain of command and so by having a chain of command um, uh, it allows to it, it allows the group to kind of get get around some of the problems that could come from just having everyone trying to argue and decide over what's going to happen, especially during combat that could be very, very difficult. Um, and then they specifically talk about you know the the difference between like bonded masters and player plus NPC teams versus like full player teams um, and specifically for combiner threats and how to deal with those. So all really, really great advice. 
Um, and then they have a bunch of Kanban seeds, um, which is basically they split them into four different tiers. You have tier one, which the tiers follow the exact same tiers for D&D fifth edition. Tier one is one to four. Two is five to 10. Tier three is 11 to 15. Tier four is 16 to 20, um, which isn't actually the same because tier four in um, D&D fifth edition is 70 to 20. So that's interesting. But part of that has to do with the fact that level 17 is when you get access to ninth level spells. So they consider that tier four. Um, and then, yeah, it just has these little campaign hooks for each tier. Um, and they're good. Like, they're, they're interesting. They're, they're fun. They have great artwork. And again, they can, uh, they can be used as just like an arc. Like, you just have a combiner arc and then go back to your, your rest of your campaign. Or you can use these, you know, you combine them a little bit to create an entire combiner kick a campaign. So, interesting stuff. So, Yeah. Moving on. So that is Transformers, uh, the enigma of Cookie Combination. And that just leaves us with final thoughts. Overall, this is a really cool book. Um, like I said, the thing that surprised me most about it is combiners are not just Transformers Megazords. They have very different rules. And because of that, they feel different. And to me, that's the most important thing in an RPG is not so much that, well, yeah, um, like I, um, somebody actually brought it up in the comments um, on one of my other videos is the idea that um, uh, in some uh, uh, RPGs, um, a lot of times like different spells is just like, oh, well, this is fireball, but it uses ice damage or, you know, it's just it's just really kind of bland, boring of it's the same basic thing. They just flavor it differently but mechanically it's the exact same thing and i'm not i'm not 100 percent against that again i'm a big fan of let the flavor rule um and allow players to flavor things in unique and interesting ways like i'm a huge huge f -f -f fan of that but when it's used too often to where yes we have you know 20 different spells and you know six of them are the same spell that just does different damage and the damage it's just damage like it's just like poison damage does the exact same thing as fire damage unless they're resistant to me that is padding your book um and so this very very easily they could have just made combiners work identical to megazords and people probably wouldn't have been upset but they didn't. They created very different rules for combiners. And because the mechanics are different, it's going to feel different. And it also means that it's going to play differently. Um, having a Megazord show up and fight some Transformers is going to be a very different conflict than having a Gestalt combiner show up and fight some Transformers. And they're going to have to fight it differently and they're going to have different objectives and that is really impressive to me. Um, again, they didn't have to do that. There are already rules that exist that would allow you to create combiner forms. And I will almost guarantee that people that have been playing Transformers before this book came out that wanted to fight Devastator or to be a part of a mega form probably already used the uh, Megazord rules to create their own combiner form. So it's not that that wasn't possible, but they decided if we're going to introduce something, we're going to make it unique. We're going to make it feel like Transformers. And that is one of the things that Essence 20 does better than any other licensed tabletop game I've ever seen is when they create new mechanics, they make sure that it feels like the source material that they have licensed. And that's a really hard thing to do. I know I have done it multiple times I, again i i work with zelda universe i created an rpg for for, for them um to mimic it was supposed to mimic breath of the wild and we did have some aspects of breath of the wild in there but we created our own uniquely zelda game and it takes a lot of work to make something feel like zelda we feel like a video game when it's not a video game um and then i did it again for tears of the realms which is, uh, again, feels like a Zelda game, despite just not being a Zelda game. Um, so yeah, the fact that they're able to, to get this stuff and make this feel like Transformers is always impressive to me. 
Um, overall, I don't really have that many negative things to say about the book. Um, aside from putting the combiner rules in the back of the character options chapter instead of the front, it's a good book. Um, again, I've been... I mentioned this before. I've been getting a little bit burnt out from Essence 20 in general. They're, they're putting out so many books and it's so expensive. Um, and the last, especially the last few like G.I. Joe books, they're adding so many new rules and things like that, that it becomes so overwhelming. And I was really starting to get worried that they were going to get this massive rules bloat that turned it into another third edition where playing at the end of third edition was such a different experience from the beginning of third edition because of the massive amount of rules bloat. The same thing is true about Pathfinder. Pathfinder first edition was is such a different game if you only play with like the first core book and that's all you, you use. It is a completely different game than if you open it up to a bunch of different books. The same thing is true about Pathfinder 2nd Edition. In D&D 5th Edition, the exact same thing. It's starting to get the rules bloat effect that they did everything they could to avoid in the beginning, back when Merles was actually doing stuff for it. Um, so getting a new Essence 20 book always gives me this fear of we're getting to that critical mass of rules bloat. And I was pleasantly surprised at this one. The only new quote unquote system that they introduce is the combiner rules. And it's not a full blown system that you have to stack onto a bunch of other systems. It just means that combiners work a little differently than other mega forms. And so you don't have to worry about balancing combiner rules with uh, you know, a bunch of different factions and a bunch of other. No, they just kind of work. It's, it's a very specific thing that you can do. And it's not going to change the entire game just when you're dealing with combiners. So overall, yeah, I'm a big fan of the book. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not as big of a Transformers fan as I am of a Power Rangers fan. But this was really cool. And if I had the time, I would love to run a combiners campaign. I think it'd be super, super fun. So anyway, that is... It's going to be all for me today. As always, remember, uh, again, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to turn notifications on. All those things are super, super important. In the comments down below, uh, how many of you guys are going to make a monk? Sorry, pugilist. How many of you guys are going to make a monk? That's all I care about. How many people are going to make a monk? Put it in the comments down below. Otherwise, again, it's all for me today, and I will see you guys in the next time. All right? Bye-bye.